Hi, everyone. Uh, you're here for the Cisco panel, uh, icing on the unicorn cake or something like that. I'm not sure what we decided on eventually. But uh, I'm Lauren Malhoy. I'll be the moderator tonight. And to my left is, go ahead, Carly. Hi, I'm Carly Stoughton. I'm a technical marketing engineer with the NCMA Business Unit, focused on ACI and Nexus 9K. Hi, I'm Yogesh Kaushik. Uh, I'm a senior director of product management and NCMA Business Unit. And for those fortunate enough not to know me, I'm Joe Onisik, principal engineer for Cisco's INSBU, focused on ACI. All right, thank you all for showing up today. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. So we're talking data center, we're talking new features, especially in uh, Nexus 9000 series switches. So Joe, let's start with you. Um, I know there's a lot of new features that came out this summer with specifically the NXOS standalone mode for Nexus 9Ks. You know, we have po uh, power on, auto provisioning, we have uh, Chef and Puppet directly on the kernel, et cetera, et cetera. Can you uh, expound upon that for us? Yeah, um, so if we look at what we've done with the 9K platform, we really have two operating systems. Um, we have the NXOS mode, in which case we run like a regular switch with a lot of enhancements that we've made to that product. Uh, then we have the ACI mode, which you hear a lot about. Uh, I'm not supposed to talk about the ACI mode. Some gentleman named Eric something, Yakety Schmack, senior director of VMware Social Media, said we can't talk about ACI. I'll be talking about it anyway. Um, but on the NXOS mode, what we really focus on is automation and programmability. We want to give you a box that allows you to run a switch in the way in which you need to for your uh, particular data center. And in that case, we offer choice. You want to use Chef? Fantastic. You want to use Puppet? Fantastic. You look into write custom scripts, run your own applications on the box, all of that's available through Linux, uh, Linux containers on the device, so on and so forth. And I think that open programmable operating system is a first from Cisco specifically. Uh, it's also probably the most open operating system for network switching out on the market today. All right, awesome. Thanks, Joe. So in that uh, another cool implementation mode <laughs> of, <ACI> the, mode. <laughs> of the of the gear here. Um, Carly, let's talk to you a little bit about um, some of the new features there. Specifically, you just put out a demo on the ACI optimizer. Yeah. So what is that? What is that exactly? Uh, give us a brief description of what that is. So essentially, the ACI optimizer allows you to sort of proof your configuration. So you're able to put in the amount of policy objects that you would expect, things like tenants, contracts, endpoint groups, put a guesstimate, if I will use that horrible word, <laughs> to see what your configuration might look like before you actually implement it on your physical hardware. So it will tell you based on how many policy objects that you think you'll have in your potential infrastructure, whether or not that will fit on the number of leaf switches you have. Uh, and optionally, you can also enter, if you have an existing configuration, existing topology, you can put that in, and actually it will uh, take the configuration versus the hardware that you've selected and tell you whether that's going to fit based on the scale numbers. So, so from, from that feature, um, you know, coming from a traditional network world, I never know if my switch is going to run out of resources till I hit the oh shit moment when TCAM's right. full. Yeah. Um, is that, is that going to help me with that type of problem on an ACI fabric? Yeah, absolutely. That's the goal is we really... In the past, we've gone from our design stage to really implementation. So this gives us a step in between where we can configure and optimize before we actually deploy it on hardware. Uh, and yeah, it does get down to the level of showing you the TCAM utilization, uh, things like longest prefix match entries that are going to be used uh, based on our verified scalability numbers. So it's a great way to estimate before we actually get in there and configure. So it gives you some real visibility, and, and yeah. just to use it like a uh, to say a specific use case, like, let's say we want to see how many endpoint groups or something we can create, yeah. or, I mean, is there something specifically that you would say would be a uh, common use case for it? Yeah, typically what we're going to look at, really, it would come down to number of endpoint groups, maybe number of contracts be between devices. Because ultimately that's going to tell us what the leaf switches can handle, how many we might need to optimize that, whether you want to dedicate a pair of leaf switches, say, to... Um, as your border leaves for external transport. You can specify actually with something called a tag 
uh, which leaf switches you deploy those objects on. So you can actually pr get pretty granular with how you configure the topology. That's awesome. And I saw it was uh, basically drag and drop. Is that? It is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's got a pretty slick interface, drag and drop the tenants, endpoint groups, contracts. And then we have just simple little screens where actually most of the fields are optional. So if you don't know, which is most likely the case, if you don't know what your infrastructure is going to look like, you can just put in the basics of how many of these are you going to have. And if you want to get more specific, you can enter things like the number of MAC addresses that you might have for a particular endpoint group. So, wow, so it gets real granular. Yeah, <laughs> you can get down in the weeds if you want to. <laughs> well, it's always Don't great to. to have as an option. Though. It's got nerd knobs. Right. Lots of nerd knobs. <laughs> All right. Well, Yogesh, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about security. Security is obviously a very important, um, not just a buzzword. I mean, it's something that that really matters within networks. Um, so let's talk about perimeter security has been very important. That's kind of how we've managed everything in traditional networking. How do you feel we need to manage it now, especially given you know our east-west traffic and virtualization, all of that good stuff? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things there. Um, perimeter security is here to stay. There, is, there are problems that have to be solved at the perimeter. But obviously, there's a, there's a new wave of things that can you put that in the host? Can you tie the policy to the workload? And it makes a lot of sense. You do have to tie certain types of threats can be only detected on the endpoint. And you do have to put them on the endpoint, and you have to ha have something host-based. The problem is not where you apply it. The problem is how do you find what the policy is. Uh, most of the customers are moving from big brownfield environment to greenfield deployments. If you have a clean application, developers know who they are talking to. Classic example is most developers don't ever care about DNS. The network guys have to always provision for DNS. So that's something that you really have to find a way to create a very clean policy model that you can apply on endpoint. And rather than just going brainless about it, saying, I'm going to just go everything endpoint or everything perimeter, you really have to pick and choose what you apply on endpoint and what you apply on the perimeter. And I think it goes back to what uh, Carly was just talking about. How do you discover, how do you make it easy to scale, to orchestrate that policy model? I think that makes a big difference. So you, you guess in that aspect, I'm thinking, in a lot of places, we don't secure an environment as well as we know we should just because we don't have the time. We can't figure it out. We can't go put them in place. So we know we should do, be doing a better job of security, but we don't. If we're getting that granular, if we're building beyond perimeter security, it sounds like we're going to need a whole lot of automation and automatic discovery to be able to make that work correctly. Is that fair? Absolutely. I think the number one reason that there's not enough security in place is because it's very, very hard to provision it. It's uh, it's. Um, laziness is the common word that's been used, but it's extremely hard when you have, you know, some of the people that I've talked to have tens of thousands of workloads. So if you want to go a host by host and apply the same policy to 100,000, 150,000 workloads, it's impossible. So you have to find a programmatic way to push this out. And you have to find a way that scales for whether the virtual machine is sitting on your VMware infrastructure or sitting in a public cloud in AWS. So there has to be a somewhat of a declarative model that you have to use to push it out. There's no way to scale it otherwise. Well, and where does this uh, you know, non-perimeter security come into play when we're talking about physical workloads as well? I mean, if we need this sort of segmentation in, in our virtual realm, don't we need that in our physical realm as well? Absolutely. So if you, if you look at... Uh, in terms of how many workloads are virtualized, you know, typically the number is anywhere about 60-70% of workloads are virtualized. But that's packing about 10 to 20 VMs per host. So if you look at how many physical servers are out there, that's a lot. If you actually do the comparison of how many servers are running virtual machines versus physical, the ratio is flipped. So if you leave the work physical workloads behind, you've basically broken the security model. Yeah, great point, great point. All right, well, let's, uh, let's move on to a, a new uh, feature as well, the, the troubleshooting wizard. Uh, Joe, can you tell us a little bit about the new troubleshooting wizard, which is kind of an awesome GUI that, that helps you fix all, all your uh, problems, right? Yeah, apparently it's like unicorns. It, it just, you know, you turn on the troubleshooting wizard, your network fixes itself. I think that's the most important part. Uh, it's, you know, something beautiful. Uh, but no, no, the troubleshooting wither, wizard within ACI, um, the product I'm not allowed to talk about because it competes very well with the product that doesn't compete at all here. Um, but in that realm, what the troubleshooting wizard does is it ties together your virtual and your physical world very well and lets you not just figure out 
am I dropping packets? Which is nice for a network engineer, but it mean meaningless to an application. It helps you figure out really quickly where those packets are dropping, what applications that have, that's affecting, and what user experience is being uh, uh, affected by that as well. So our troubleshooting wizard is really bundling up a lot of the intelligence that's already inside the ACI fabric and being able to expose that in a way that helps you quickly identify and, and remediate problems. So, I mean, it really comes down to is that just it's about packets dropping and then identifying that. Um, th that's, that's the essential usefulness of the troubleshooting wizard. I'd say, I'd say that's one mm -hmm. example of the different okay. tools that are built into that product set. Um, there, there are several other ways to kind of look at and identify what's going on there, but that's one good example. Because as a network engineer, I'm typically on a traditional network focused on packet loss. Where are those packets being lost? Where is a Mac flapping? Device by device hopping through a network and then trying to figure out where the problem is. With this suite of troubleshooting tools that we've added in with the troubleshooting wizard, now I can look at the network as a whole and troubleshoot end-to-end -end connectivity between, let's say, two devices. This group of servers is talking to this group of servers. Where's my problem? And we get a deep dive into the physical, the fabric, the whatever's in between, the layer four through seven, service graphs, what have you. Absolutely. And we're not just sitting there where we take a look and say, okay, well, the virtual environment looks fine, so now call another team and have them go to the command line and troubleshoot the physical network, which as a virtualization company, I'll call it the underlay, but it's actually rather important. In this case, we're looking at the virtual environment, the physical environment, we're tying them together and actually helping you run a network. And I think on top of that, one of the powers of the tool is we're not just anymore looking at, say, okay, from this IP address to this IP address, which we may not know, right? If someone picks up the phone and says exchange isn't working, we can actually start with, say, the endpoint group or even the application profile. Look at, say, this piece to this piece. Who's talking? What are they talking about? And actually start narrowing it down to the root cause. So looking at it more at the application level versus just a particular machine to machine, I think, is one of the big powers there. Yeah. Very good. Well, are, are there any other exciting new features that uh, you guys want to talk about before we wrap it up? I, I mean, the only thing I'd leave with is if you need a network, you call Cisco. We've been doing it quite a while. Pretty good at it. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining and watching later on YouTube, perhaps. And uh, thank you all for being a part of this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren.